And now, the Andy Greenwald Podcast. Welcome to the Gremlin Network. My name is Andy Greenwald, and it is a miserable, snowy day in New York City, but it is warm and toasty inside the studio because, at long last, I am finally joined by the multi-talented uh, songwriters, performers, queens of Instagram, <laughs> Tegan and Sarah Quinn. You guys, thank you so much for finally making this happen. I really appreciate it. We are delighted. And I, thank you for picking such a absolutely miserable day to have to come to Midtown. But as Canadians, <laughs> aren't you better suited to this? Isn't yeah. this in your in your DNA? We think we deserve it. <laughs> that's how it, that's how it works. What I is, thought maybe it brought out your your innermost abilities like you you shine only in snow you know getting you at a better day tegan has been a west coast resident for over 10 years and in 14 in when i was uh living in vancouver at 22 i knew it wasn't the the right place for me and i moved to montreal which has you know fairly similar weather patterns and seasons to new york maybe a little colder but um i remember deciding that winter was one of the most like profoundly important um, seasons because it it made weak people leave and it 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 allowed strong people to remain and so this is darwin as meteorologist it really mm-hmm. i'm not joking because now we have the choice like if you're like a settler and you just came from whereverville and you're in the you're in like like rural manitoba you didn't have a choice like you just had to stay with your horse and buggy and your wife that you didn't even like and your in idiot order, kids you know. and like the whole thing but now you have the choice you can just be like you know what not for me i'm gonna move somewhere warm but now people choose. People choose to stay. I stayed 10 years in Montreal. And even though the winters are really cold, it just there's something really cleansing about this this season that literally kills everything. Yeah. Like, no bugs. Nothing survives. I don't know. Under the ground, hope, maybe? But Hope is dead. You know what? Hope, but hope lives on because mm-hmm. spring is coming. And it just, I don't know. There's something really magical about that. Surviving. Okay, but... I appreciate that. I respect that. I, for some reason, live in this godforsaken tundra, <laughs> too. But before... The, okay, we'll move off of weather in a second. But, but Tegan, doesn't... This is Canadian, by the way. Like, just, what just we've just done weather. here, like, to huh. completely take over this interview and just talk about weather immediately. We're basically... You're basically our father, and we've called you on Sunday to talk about the weather. How long does this usually last? Like it An is, hour. Okay, that's how much we roughly. have. So we, we, can, we can burn through it. <laughs> what, what I want to know is... Doesn't it feel better just to give that up? Like, if you're, if it's not snowing, aren't you just happier? Because I feel like, on some level, if I'm being honest, and I feel like I can be honest be with you Be honest guys, with us. It, it's miserable living here half the year, but that misery makes me feel better about myself because I'm suffering. <laughs> and you people aren't. But I, wouldn't it just be better to give that up entirely and be happy? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, as someone who has lived on the West Coast, and Vancouver does have pretty great weather a lot of the time, but then kind of crappy weather, too. Rainy. Rainy weather, yep. And, you know, I also lived in Los Angeles part-time for three and a half years. It's sunny. And it's sunny and beautiful. It's actually way nicer there than people even let on. Like, I think some people have this misconception that it's just, like, blistering hot too much of the year, but actually it's Mm kind of just perfect there. So... I've become less of a West Coast person and more of just a nice weather person. So, but it is nice. I will say that it is there's something very pleasant about not having to suffer. I mean, I did live 19 years in Calgary and did suffer through a lot of the winter weather you guys just talked about for 10 years. Though I did kind of zone out while you guys were talking about it because it's old news for me. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, and it is. It's really nice. It's really nice to be in good weather. But it's something we talk about a lot. There's so much good music comes out of really cold, awful, miserable places. You know, especially in Canada. You know, you think about Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, and I, I think about The Weaker Thans. The Weaker Thans, like a lot right. of this music came out of really cold, miserable, awful places because there's nothing else to do right? but make art. <laughs> that's right. That's also like the Pacific Northwest because yeah. it's just it's just pitch black dark yeah. the Sad third of there. the year. And so you just yeah. sit in your basement and you emote. And even for us, I mean, I think about, you know, when we stopped touring, um, so jealous to write the con, you know, like, I mean, it was kind of miserable and rainy in Vancouver and, you know, there was only sun for like, like, and it wasn't even sun, just light for like maybe six hours a day. And I just remember feeling like not one ounce of guilt about staying inside in the studio all day long and just being miserable and writing really sad songs. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that didn't occur to me. I guess I would feel, I guess when it's nice out and I'm sitting at home writing all day, I feel guilty. You feel guilty? Sure. Yeah. Because that's how I feel in Vancouver because when it does get nice there, it's like every single Vancouver, like two and a half million people walk outside and that's just, everyone has shorts on and and, and they're smiling and you just, you can't bear to be indoors, so. Shorts and smiling. I know, I don't know it's that. horrible. That don't move. Which is why I hate the West Coast. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Just as soon as I see someone smiling with shorts. 
they should be running out of a college dorm like they took bath salts. They shouldn't be like yeah. enjoying something. They shouldn't be. Yeah, they shouldn't be smiling. They should no. just be so that's screaming. why we don't make any art in the summer, though. Oh, you take the summers off from of art. Of course. Too, yeah, too much smiling and short wearing. I hate people anything. who make art in the summer. Okay, interesting. We should, at some point, <laughs> maybe when we, you know, we'll do the after show, we could, like, <laughs> divide all artists between summer artists and non-summer artists. <laughs> okay, but back to the issue at hand. One thing that is very exciting for me to have you guys here is that um, the first time, and perhaps the only other time I have officially interviewed you mm -hmm. was 14 years ago. It may have been the summer. <laughs> Uh, it was on a couch in the Spin.com uh, office building, mm -hmm. and I had only just that day become familiar with your work. I think you only had... That happens a lot with journalists. Yes. Oh, well, we could talk about that. <laughs> but the pitch was you were um, sisters, and you I think you were making uh, folk songs, mm -hmm. and you would, you would agree to come in and play acoustic guitar on our couch. That was all it took. Mm -hmm. And you came in, totally delightful people that you still are today. <laughs> Now you are global pop stars. Mm -hmm. This is, first of all, you're welcome, because clearly that interview... <laughs> you started us off. Yep. Set this off. Thank you. Um, let's go back. Let's take me back there. Take me back to you guys just starting out. Uh, I think you were on Vapor Records at that point with, mm -hmm. with... Which is probably how we ended up with the folk moniker, because we certainly wouldn't have assigned it to ourselves, you know, but we did have Vapor, which was Neil Young's record label right. and manager, um soliciting on our behalf at that time. I mean, we were we had probably just inked a, like a very, very basic rudimentary deal. They were going to uh, distribute and help market what is essentially now. I mean, to me, an like an acoustic record, but like would have been very much like a folk record for them. Right. And <clears throat> they were they saw the promise in us as songwriters. And, you know, I think that that sort of um, I don't know that 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 idea that we would grow and develop into something else really did set us on this interesting path because we never really saw ourselves as being part of one genre of music. We really well, we never even talked about genre. No. When we signed our record deal, it was exclusively under this sort of premise that we were songwriters and that we would write great songs throughout our 20s and we'd get to our 30s and write a great record that might might actually do something or change the world in some way, but that we shouldn't rush that. You know, Elliot was like, go It was very out. 70s, the pitch. Yeah, yeah. it was Wait, like, go experience they said that to life. You guys? Yeah. yeah. This is in how we were signed. Industry? I know. Yeah, yeah, we were like 17, <laughs> and Elliot Roberts, Neil Young's manager, came up and had dinner with us. And we our were mom, 18. That's 18. a little ambi that, Yeah, 18. No, we were not because we were 17 because my our mom wouldn't let us sign the record deal because we were not 18 yet. You're you're skipping a whole year, Let's which is on. awesome. You deleted a year off your life, but we but it, we we were 18 the first time that we met Elliot, and we signed. We actually inked the deal just in just shy of like 1999, but. But it was it was our intention not to ink a deal. Like what you're remembering is that we played a we played sort of a South by Southwest esque gig while we were still in high school, and every major label in Canada sort of called and were like, "Oh, we'd like to talk about doing a demo deal with the girls." And my mom was like, "Get away." Okay, fair. Yeah, that, that's true. And so that we did true. some. You know, we we graduated high school. We did the right thing. We graduated high school. We read some books on the industry. We played a bunch of shows, and then Sarah got a job working at. A music store and I got a job at a coffee shop and we put together a budget and borrowed money from my grandfather and we made our first record under feet like ours and that record Elliot right. Roberts heard and he flew down to this um it flew to Vancouver and he came and saw us play at this place called the Starfish Room which is now closed and we um had sold it out which was like the biggest deal it was like 300 people or something and Elliot yeah he took us out for dinner afterwards and it's very unlike what you hear in the music industry these days but it was a very sort of 60s or 70s you know, era approach, but he was like, you'll get signed to a major label. You will get marketed as some sort of like twin teen girl act. They'll make one terrible pop record with you and that'll be the end of your career. It was a good pitch because that sounded awful. And yeah. he was like, or you can come work with us and we want to fly you down to South by Southwest. You'll meet Neil Young and consider this other option, which is that you guys write great songs, but you haven't experienced anything in life yet, which we were completely like, you know, we thought that was like we were like yeah. that's we were like what does he know? And Doesn't he, like, he know we work at a coffee shop <laughs> at a record yeah. store? He was like you'd haven't experienced love or heartbreak or life, and we were like idiot. Of course we have, but he was like you know take go out on the road. We'll put you on the road. It's no frills. You're not going to be rock stars. You're going to work. You're going to earn. You're going to do it the old school way. What's and Sarah and I both thought that that was great. Sarah actually, you know, we were in therapy together at the time because we you know we were really struggling like with the idea: should we go to college? Should we get right. real jobs? Like, do we really follow this path? And I think both of us, when that was pitched to us, that felt way more realistic. You know, we were very uh, grounded and pragmatic at that point. It so. felt open-ended too. He didn't. It didn't feel like he was um, 
trapping us. He was offering us <laughs> an opportunity. We were trapped, though. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Sure. We but learned this, that later. But yeah. so, this is, so this is what would have happened just before we would have met you. And, mm-hmm. and, and all of a sudden, we were doing the rounds. What's crazy to me about this story is that it's what you said. It's very it's a very 1970s style pitch. And yeah. <laughs> as much as that is, well, as much as that a came true, it seems like he <laughs> did predict your career for the most part. He really did. And b it, it does seem more appealing than the alternative vision that you could have been pitched, which is I'll make you guys famous by next Tuesday. Yeah. Um, in a way, that also kind of sounds like a lie, considering the decade that was to come. Like, oh, we'll just we'll be patient with you. You'll write some songs. You'll have time to live life. You'll make a great record later. <laughs> that's the trap part. That's that the we trap didn't part, realize, right? Because yeah. that's not the decade that you guys were about to embark on mm-hmm. in your career. That's not the way the industry worked at all. No. But, you know, because we were always so outside of it, sort of, uh, you know, partly on purpose, like, we, you know, there were certainly times where... I think out of fear, not necessarily out of um, like visionary, you know, I don't think that Tegan and I were visionaries in the sense that we were like, oh, we should not do what everybody else is doing and avoid some of the trappings that some of these other bands and peers are going to fall in, you know, fall into. I think um, a lot of it was nervousness and shy, like being shy and not wanting to necessarily do the things that other people were doing. I I think in a lot of ways we avoided um, things that were going to make us more successful and definitely avoided social and networking situations that were going to make us or we're going to make inroads for us at that time. And um, that allowed us to sort of be on this strangely parallel, but we always would say, like, we were on the dirt road while everyone else was on that kind of, like, big highway. Like, everybody was sort of being moved and um, and, and changed, and, and things were coming really fast, and we were kind of bumping along the highway you know, on our little dirt road. And we were able to, I think, see some of the changes um, more clearly because we were moving slower. So we were able to quickly change things. Um, we, you know, for example, a lot of people talk about when people stopped buying records. Well, no one ever bought our records. So we were not shocked by this. You guys were ahead of the curve. We were ahead of the curve. We were like, we never got used to selling records. So therefore we're not, we didn't care that suddenly there was these dramatic percentage drops or whatever. We had always sold our music online. We had always hustled at shows and sold our records hand to hand. We had always relied on merchandise. We had, we had really quite literally sold t-shirts to pay our rent and so you know and this is not like a braggy like we did it we did it so honestly we did it just the way we had to do it there was no other option for us and so we I think because of that experience we were very versatile as, as our career started to go through you know um, the bumps and curves that everybody else was experiencing we were able to like really quickly like um, you know move up or move down move left move right whatever we had to do we were able to you know we were able to be quick on our feet well it does seem like you you guys have been uniquely able to navigate the music industry in a way that mirrors the way people actually listen to music now, Mm. which is to say that in like in the days when I was at Spin, um, you know, 10 years ago, the idea of someone recording a record with Chris Walla and then getting on stage with Taylor Swift, I would have been like, who is Taylor Swift? Is that the 12 year old that is living in Pennsylvania? (laughs) But you get my point. The idea of someone jumping between those worlds doesn't doesn't make much sense. But Uh actually, I would imagine many people who have your records probably have a Death Cab record and probably have a Taylor Swift record. Mm -hmm. So you're able to sort of move professionally between those worlds in a way that makes sense to listeners, even if it didn't make sense to, I'm using air quotes, the industry as a whole. (laughs) Well, I think that, you know, what's funny is that Sarah Nice Foundation as music listeners and music fans is really diverse and weird. So to us, it doesn't seem weird that someone who owns a Death Cab record and a Taylor Swift record would listen to Tegan and Sarah. So when it happened to us, right. it felt very natural, like um, because we grew up listening to Super Tramp and Bruce Springsteen, but also Sublime and Green Day, you know? Right. So we really, like we would literally, you know, put on rancid at a party and then we'd put on a super trap record like that was our group of friends like we were quite influenced by our parents and and our friends and our peers and um and not so much media and so when we got into making music for us it we were always really versatile we took every kind of tour you know we toured with neil young but then we went out on tour with ben folds you know then we would go out with ryan adams and then we would do a tour with melissa Farrick. you know we just always were diversifying i think we always just saw it as a benefit like to get in front of an audience that was different and get fans from everywhere. And we've quickly realized that, you know, young women would really relate to us, but that young men did too. And then the hard rock community really attached to us. A lot of the like, you know, punk pop bands and a lot of the like, oh yeah, like screamo bands and like emo bands, like they started reaching out or referencing, name checking us. Well, you and, also then would collaborate in all directions. Exactly. You're on an Against, against Me record and a Tiesto record. Right mm-hmm. around the sort of mid 2000s, that's when that started to happen. Like just a really wide variety of acts started reaching out, everything from electronic to punk music. And we, we didn't see it as, you know, um, a hindrance to our 
genre or our niche. Tegan is also doing air quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because, you know, Thank sometimes you. people <laughs> sometimes people will say that, like, you know, you don't want to confuse your brand. Well, our brand isn't a specific genre. Our brand is Tegan and Sarah. Like, that's it. Like, we're not pop or punk or funk or, you know, folk or electronic. We're everything. A little and, bit funk. Yeah. Well, and everybody wants to attach a label to us, and that's great. Like, I hope people do. Like, I hope people, like, my favorite of all, like, I have 15 years of being called different things. My favorite still to this day was the mini pops singing Green Day songs. Like, that was some, someone said our record was like. And I was like, we grew up listening to the mini pops, which the mini pops, for listeners who don't know who they are, was like basically children that were like dolled up to look like basically prostitutes who were singing old songs like, you know, Yellow Submarine and dancing around. It was really popular in Canada and Europe, but it was like banned in America. Good, with good reason. <laughs> That's terrifying. But we but... loved it. Sarah and I would like order all the neighborhood kids around and we would like have them all lip sync to the mini pops and we put on costumes. It spoke and... to us. It wasn't kids being kids. It was kids acting it like adults. kids being prostitutes. Yeah, we were <laughs> yeah, into that. Really well, related to prostitution. Pro- one person's prostitute is another person's <laughs> adult, you know, whatever. <laughs> you guys have been in Hollywood too long. Uh, um... Okay, but we, Tegan, you mentioned being trapped, and I think you were alluding to a, in an actually like contractual sense. But <laughs> what did you do then to wriggle out of the sort of um, genre traps that you could find yourself in, especially as a as a a younger artist? You know, I mean, to basically not have to go down with any one ship. This allowed you to continue to reinvent yourself and. Well, there and, was, I mean, there was a consistency with the media. It doesn't matter what, I mean, I swear to you, I swear to you, people still refer to us as folk. Do you want, I mean, do you want, do you want to do the spin quote that you guys I mean, still hate? What was that, what was that w- quote? Uh, a Wiccan folk nightmare. Yeah. But so this is You guys is a, are a Wiccan folk dream. This, That's just ridiculous. Here's the thing though. It's like, I really, uh, I always would, I would think this because I listen to a lot of acoustic pop music. Like I, 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 I never could make sense of why Sufjan was, you know, all of these interesting, versatile, you know, descriptors and, and Tegan Azera was just folk all the time. And I was like, right. It's, it's obvious. Weird. It's, the, <laughs> it's like steeped in all of this weird sexism and homophobia and whatever. And so when I see folk, I bristle, not because I hate folk, but because I think that it was the media saying, no, this is this is how we will continue to reinforce how not cool we think this is. Right. And for us, that, I mean, this is so weird, but it's like, in a way, that allowed us to just do whatever we wanted. Because we just kept thinking, well, we just worked on a Tiesto track, and yet, in the Cleveland whatever, they just called us a folk band again. So, you know, we just kept thinking, like, it did. we, we weren't put into this category that um, alienated anybody from accepting us as a dance act, or as a pop act, or as an indie rock act. And you know, it was the the sort of um, because there was no accuracy. Like the, I didn't feel we were being described right. right. I didn't think that it was important, and so we just kind of did what we wanted to do. And we we've always well, and that's how we avoided avoided the trappings in a strange way. Was that you know, even though we were signed to a major label, like we sort of we didn't buy into any specific model. We didn't buy into any specific mainstream idea. We didn't fit anywhere specific. So we spent like a good chunk of the 2000s doing whatever we wanted. Yeah. And kind of like this was very in line with what Elliot Roberts had pitched to us when we were 19 years old was that we weren't <clears throat> consumed or concerned with what people thought. We weren't making music for any one specific type of person and we certainly weren't making it to impress our label or to sell records. So it allowed us to explore and actually live the life we were supposed to live and experience all of this incredible stuff that started to really like we and we also at this point while all that's happening all that life experience is happening we started to get a real handle on how to write music Mm -hmm. and how to produce music and how to play our instrument and how to entertain and how to make 10,000 people watch us and and how to sing better and play better and how to run a business and how to run a band and 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 in the meantime all of that heartbreak and life experience is happening. And I think we just managed all of a sudden the last couple records that we made, those two paths finally sort of um, became one. And I think we just made better records because of it. But I, but I think that being ignored and not being cool was what allowed us to actually become really cool. Also, you, you didn't provide people on my side of the ball with a very good story because you just kept making good records. <laughs> like one, one of the reasons why I'm pretty happy not to be in music journalism anymore is one, because magazines are a dying right. industry and <laughs> music is not doing so well either. But that aside, um, there are only so many stories that you can write about a band. Yeah, um, it's, it's generally, it's the, it's either the best album or the comeback or the, the return from drugs or the precipice album yeah. or the, or, or the, or the hot new thing. Those yeah. are, those are the storylines. So boring. It's, and, and if you don't fit into those, yeah. I mean, it's the same reason why, um, like if you look over a decade of, of like best of 
best albums of the year and Spin, I think Spoon will have every one of their records is in the top 20, but there's never been a feature written about them. Right. Because all the albums are good. Well, that's boring. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> also, too, I mean, this is the thing is that the thing that I think is really interesting about us, um, you know, professionally or you know, publicly, you know, is maybe the story of like how, how our career has gone and, and some of the business decisions that we've made or some of the little anecdotes here or there that string it all together. But that's not that interesting to the average person. You right. know, I mean, the reality is, is that our, a lot of our fan base that is really signed on and is deeply immersed in the culture of our band and the music of our band, that's not what stories get written about. You know, those are their stories. Those are, those are their moments. That's for them to deal with. They right. don't need to read about us in Spin. Um, to understand what's going on, they're they're living it. They're like, they're they're they don't need they don't need writers. So in a weird way, music writing I think has become for other music writers and other become. musicians. You know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it always was. I don't yeah. know. Well, pre internet. I mean, we 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 had a subscription I mean, to, it, yeah. to spin the, when we were teenagers. We did. We did want your opinion. Yeah. You know, yeah. we did want the but mostly we wanted the pictures then. to put up on our walls. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. true. We would read the articles and then we'd put all the pictures. I up wrote our some walls. of the that's best true. pictures in that magazine. <laughs> But it's it's it has changed. I mean, the internet is a lot. I mean, that's we. This is one of the things we experienced on the bumpy road next to the, you know, mainstream success highway was that we saw social media long before it became the norm for every band to we, do it. We actually we cultivated, invented the internet. Well, but we cultivated Just a really strong foundation. Congratulations on that. <laughs> we cultivated a strong foundation and a really honest, direct relationship with our audience before yes. it was cool to do it. You know, we we had a Tegan and Sarah website with a you know question and answer and like send an email and we'll respond to you in 1999. That's when we started doing it i would sit backstage on dial up and i would answer you know five to ten emails an hour a year <laughs> to fans <laughs> well but so when social keep, media became popular <laughs> but when social media became super popular and expected you know the record labels expect you to be on social media all the time like when you know when we sort of re-upped our deal with our major label like it was sort of <clears> one of the big fights that we had a good fight like a positive fight mm -hmm. but they were like we need you to be you know on twitter and all the social media and you got to stay up on all that stuff and we were like okay why don't we take a five minute break and you guys go on the internet and see that that's what we've been doing for 10 years you guys run you guys run the internet yeah we, we actually started it, twitter but you yeah. <laughs> you guys do you, you guys give good tweets it's yeah, hard, we give, it's and hard. we walk that fine line i don't think like i said i feel like it's an honest conversation that we're having with our audience we're not trying to we're not trying to create scandal with our audience we're not trying to convince them to listen to us because we're cool or like there's going to be some crazy you know salacious like you know tidbit that's going to come out by accident in the middle of the night when i'm drunk like we actually have a really responsible relationship with our audience we treat them like they are equals like they are our peers we respect them we don't overdo it we don't but can i just say one, them, can like, i say one thing this is not this is not a prescription for every band no like, i work with other bands i work like you know in s sort of light a and r producery kind of capacities and everybody's always looking for the answer to like how do i make my band or how do i make this band successful and i guess the implication is like you know if we if we know them if we know the mysteries and secrets of your career then we can apply it to others and it's just it's just not true like what we do works for the kind of people that like our band but what Justin Bieber does works for me. I like his Instagram. I want to see him shirtless with his pretend mustache, and I want I want to. I, I want to. Why? You're a big drag racing fan. Yeah. Like, I just, been. I want to. I want to look at that. I don't want to necessarily, like, there's lots of people who have really pretty, cool, you know, aesthetically standoffish Instagrams. I don't really look at those. I look at the really out of control, crazy ones. You know, that's yeah. what I get up in the morning and look at. But then we well, somehow hey, anytime landed... you want to start putting a big yeah. joint in your mouth and tweeting like a bra smoking a joint <laughs> photo of herself. Feel free to help our band get some new yeah, fans. Where's huh? Tegan Sarah Instagram after hours? Yeah, Sarah you know? took over Instagram when she got an iPhone six months ago, and all I see is selfies of you in winter jackets. Oh, yeah. she's a boob. <laughs> oh my god. We actually. Uh, I also just got reprimanded recently because Sarah and I also have. Not only are we like totally PG. And constantly, like, we both have tons of tattoos and, like, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're constantly wearing, like, layers and jackets. And you could just see, like, I mean, I am con I'm making a contact with our publicist right now. So not him, but everyone else, I feel like, at the label a lot of time, industry, they want to see more. They're like, come on, sell your body, do yeah. this, do that. You know, or, like, I got reprimanded recently. Uh, I won't reveal my source, but for calling ourselves old all the time. Like, they were like, stop. We're at Us no. Weekly, and they were like, stop saying you're old. Like, Pop doesn't want old. No. You need, I'm like, what What am I supposed to do? Get up every morning and go to Wikipedia and say I'm we're 23? I've decided like, that I was first old. All, yes. Okay. Or you hire someone to do right, that. Right. Well, I've decided I'm super offended by it, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give up on my people. 
in my age group, and so maybe right. I will replace old with mature. That's, That's what right. I've decided. How about wise? Wise and mature. Yeah. Instead of saying like I feel so old, or I see Lord. Right. And old feels. Different. I see Lord's birthday. You know, on you know, in every in every article I read about her, they're constantly reinforcing how yeah. young she is, and it's like, how do we not in the mature community feel mature? mature? <laughs> so sad. How you do we not? To, I think you and I need to represent for our fellow twenty-five year olds. <laughs> fellow twenty-five. You know? yeah. I mean, I thought I thought you know this year I think I'm turning twenty-five. Replace... I mean, I. I didn't think no, but I think you're right. I think it's about strategy, though. It's about changing. And and that's also us showing our versatility and our uh, how we adapt. Like, you're right. We aren't old. And first of all, we don't look old. So we have to stop saying we're old because old actually does conjure up a certain image. And we don't. We're mm-hmm. youthful. We take good care of ourselves. We make great music. And I think people of all ages can relate to us. So I think it's true. I think we just need to say that we've we've had a really... We've had a, a good career. This is not our first time around the block, you know. And, and no, that's not at old. Which is another, old, which right? is I mean, another way of saying you're old. Still the first time around the block. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't passed go yet. Just it's even only our using, second time even around using the block. that, like even using that phrase, would make you seem mature to a lot of people. I know, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Maybe I will start going. But maybe that'll be. I'm just recently started drinking coffee because I yeah. told you guys. Maybe every morning I'll just get up and I will change our Wikipedia to yeah. like a different age and just confuse the media and our friends and maybe myself. And I'll start just calling myself 26. <laughs> and just start Snapchatting all your fans individually. Snap, just just I, illicit we, pictures of Manny. And we probably, I've, I'm not exaggerating when I say that we've probably exchanged 35 emails about Snapchat in the last six months. <laughs> and yet we have not Snapchatted yet. We just we keep asking for an chat. explanation no. of what I the can't hell Snapchat it. is. Well, I I feel like that's the line I'm drawing. Is How your do publicist I do like, it? I, is, like I just feel like that's I'm okay drawing that line. <laughs> I have gone around the block. We're not allowed. I don't. Nobody wants me on there. I don't want to be on there. I'm I'm cool. I mean, no, I'm not. So maybe, I don't need to. Maybe be on this there. will be how I will help roll out the after hours. Tegan and Sarah is by snapping some chats. They just snap at some those people. chats. So people snap what the hell it is? After 35 emails, I still don't know what it is. I feel confused. It, it vanishes. It's a temporary image. Then why use it? Because you want to send something that you might not want the other person to always have. But then why does a band use it with their fans, and how does that work? Like, I Snapchat millions They don't of, really, do they? Yes. Oh my fans God, look, do? Turn around. Look at Andrew right now. They're trying to get us to Snapchat you for want the six months. Snapchat? Warner's like, Snapchat. Do you see the pressure, Snapchat, Snapchat. Snapchat. Do you see the pressure that we have fi- What would you Snapchat, like, like the beginning day? of a knock-knock joke that we you're going to finish at the show that know. night? We literally do not know. Listen, this is why there's been 30 emails. Tegan, I mean, Tegan is is probably embellishing slightly here, but, like, there has been there has been a lot. There has been a lot of... of uh, Wow, words written about this issue media. because I can like I think of myself as being a fairly um, intelligent person and I can I have a high uh, reading comprehension I mm-hmm. read a lot of books um, you have both many digitally fine leather bound volumes yeah, in your I, apartment. I generally have I have a, a fairly decent grasp on the English language mm-hmm. I don't understand Snapchat I've read about it I've googled I've done well, research you understand the concept you just don't know how we would use it I don't know how that, we would use it yeah for ourselves. you know what I can see Andrew's eyes lighting up right now and I know he's going to give us a presentation about it later today mm-hmm. That's and the presentation homework. will vanish after 30 it seconds so you better pay attention <laughs> you have to look out for Tegan and Sarah uh, coming to Snapchat in 2014 this is gonna be a big year for you guys yeah um Speaking of big years, and also at the risk of sounding older than Neil Young's manager, now, <laughs> I think that one of the things that you guys have done consistently that is really remarkable is that you guys write great songs. Thank you. And have continued to get better at writing good songs. And mm-hmm. what I'm curious about was yeah. your thinking coming off of, of Sainthood and then going into Heartthrob, where clearly you guys made a decision to try something new. Mm-hmm. And... Let me preface that by saying, not new in terms of the song, because the songs on St. Hood and, and, the, and the, on the three records before that were great pop songs mm-hmm. that maybe if you had, you know, taken to Greg Kirsten or worked on a similar way, could have been exactly, you know, could have been as big as Closer. Mm-hmm. Many sure. Years. But you made a decision to try something new. Why did you make that decision and how did you make it? Well, I'll say personally for myself, um, you know, I think Tegan had, I'm not blaming our career ambitions solely on her. But I think a lot of what was, um, you know, was was sort of like making me feel pressure to think outside of our, you know, our box in, in terms of like music and producers and that sort of thing was Tegan's sort of request to like think more about working with pop producers. And, and, and we... I, I, I wanted bigger. She was, wanted bigger. A big record. She started we like great songs. Why not? Take it as far as we possibly can. And, and that, was there one? Was there an inciting incident for that, or are you just sort of tired was, of doing the same I thing? I think at the end different? of sainthood, I know for myself, what my biggest fear was was ending up in a position where it had worked for sainthood for the most part to have Tegan send me a song that was like all trashy electric guitar and like kind of a punk backbeat, and and then try to like figure out how that works, you know, sequentially on a record with Alligator 
you know, where I'm like using like, you know, like, I, I don't even know, like a totally, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Almost like formless kind of song, like just like a, almost like a call and answer, just like two parts re- repeating over and over and over I again. I still take you know? credit for the dance remixes of that song. Yeah. I don't deserve them, <laughs> but I feel like I just deserve it, credit. You know what? You, I'm going to give you full credit, but I think like we had had fun trying to figure out how to make my kind of weird formless songs work with Tegan's more structured, kind of almost like punk rock kind of, um, you know, energy of that record, but I did not want to do that again. And I, and so when Tegan started talking about working with pop producers and pushing ourselves a little bit, I thought, well, if this, I don't have a suggestion of how to avoid the trappings of going into another record that feels too complicated to like marry our two sounds. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe having somebody whose goal, you know, and, and job it is to make that happen. Because in some ways, Chris Walla, I love Chris Walla. I loved those records we made with him. But his job was to sort of nurture us and give mm-hmm. us a safe space to do whatever we wanted and to kind of almost encourage and 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 um and I don't know, like kind of balance us, but also just let us go down our path. If we if I wanted to go make the weird formless pop indie song fine if she wants to do north shore and and rock out like she's in a punk band in the 90s let her but i thought to myself well maybe if i agree to do more of a pop record and work with a pop producer we're going to end up with somebody sort of cracking the whip in a different way and Mm -hmm. instead of encouraging us to be different he's going to force us to find you know commonality like between what i do and what she does and i think that's what happened with greg kirsten i really do i think also like sarah's saying like after sainthood there was a lot of conversation about like okay we don't want to go down the same path you know like was so jealous it was like such a huge transition for us like in the mid 2000s like mm-hmm. it was such a big deal to employ a keyboard player on tour and to like make a record where we explored a lot of those synths and sort of like keyboard sounds and like t- really took ourselves out of the folk rock arena and i think you know with the con and sainthood we really did experiment each record we did something so different with the con you know we recorded all those songs ourselves and then added the band afterwards with sainthood we recorded live off the floor we tried not to do as much overdubbing like each record we really tried to push ourselves as writers and performers but yeah i felt like there was just some there was a huge part of the industry that we were avoiding maybe or we were we i, I became convinced that we were afraid to be successful like, I just kept hearing from a lot of writers, but also from other producers that I was taking meetings with and industry, people at the record company, even some of our peers in the industry, like other musicians. They just were like, you guys write these amazing pop songs. You could be popular, and yet you guys seem content to be sort of over there in the underground. Why not, you know, diversify your sound and diversify your audience and, and consider the mainstream as an option? And, you know, when I started thinking about it, like, like just as a fan, I thought how proud some of our fans would be after 10 years of supporting us to see us on pop radio, which most of them were. I mean, some were like, we hate it. Don't be popular. You're ours. But most of them were like, I think felt validated having supported us because I think we are songwriters and we're storytellers and we're performers and our community has come along with us to this next level of our career, you know? And I think once all those things were floating between Sarah and I, we just became really compelled to make a record that reached more people. It just felt like our time to diversify things. Well, you, you did, and Heartthrob is an incredible record, and I'm just, just even just as a fan of music, not just as a fan of you guys, I was so grateful that you did it, because one of the things that makes me crazy about music at the moment is this, what appears to be a fear of ambition. Yeah. I mm-hmm. think that one of the advantages, well, one, it's sort of an advantage that's turned into a curse, which is anybody can listen to anything now, and you can make a lane for yourself in a way that didn't exist before. So if you want to make you know, artistic alterna folk, no offense. <laughs> um, there are fans built into that, to that, uh, ready ready to receive that. Mm-hmm. Pitchfork will cover you in a certain way mm-hmm. and you will be lumped in with certain other artists and you can do that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's led to a real complacency. I feel like the majority of acts, even some that I like a lot on who, you know, are on Pitchfork's top 50 or spin would cover in some way, I want to see them try harder. Yeah. I kind of want to see him see what it could be, not just settle into what it is. And, you know, I, I, I maybe it's a, obviously you guys had better songs than them, so so <laughs> screw them. But Obviously. Obviously. But also, I, maybe it's the fact that you have had the time on that parallel non-highway yeah. road to sort of, to build the comfort that would allow you to um, take the chance. You know, you're not, you, you, it felt natural to do it as mm-hmm. opposed, in some ways, as opposed to a more aggressive mm-hmm. 
Well, the big also extreme leap. I mean, I think that what you're saying is <clears throat> totally right. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what any band is thinking when they go in to make a record. You, Five minutes till we start trash talking. You get, that's, how, that's the speed round. <laughs> you get, you sort of get these little tidbits of what people are thinking and what they, you know, what they were listening to or what their goals were about a record. But it's so, I mean, God, it's so complex, like how you end up at a place where you deliver a record to the public. But I will say this. Everybody, when we started doing press for this record, kept saying, it was such a risk. It was such a risk that you did this. It was a risk to try to be, to be popular, yeah. to make music that it sounds was, popular. Uh, yeah, people were like, it's such a risk. I kept hearing that word over and over and over again. And I said, you know, the only risk um, that I saw before we made this record was doing the same thing. Because yeah. my biggest fear was even if we wrote... I don't know. We wrote the coolest record and all of a sudden Pitchfork thought we were like the bee's knees and like Vampire Weekend who? Like Tegan and Zara. They're the new coolest band in the face of the planet. Like even if we had written the best Tegan and Zara record of our lives, the best, coolest sounding songs, I my biggest fear was that it wouldn't be enough to continue moving forward. I, I was so afraid. Like it was almost like a feeling of static, like the way that the way that simple movements or simple things in dreams can feel catastrophic. Like, that's how I felt about our career. It was like, here we are clipping along. Everyone sort of admires us and pat on the back and you're doing great. And I just kept thinking I had this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach about our next record. And I've never felt that way before. Mm. I've always kind of seamlessly gone from one record to the next without really feeling that. And I felt it profoundly after Sainthood. And I think that that was really the impetus for me, you know, wanting to, and maybe that's sort of what I was babbling about before, that I think I was afraid that if Tegan just delivered songs like she had delivered to me with Sainthood, I, I, I may have been done. Like, I may have just been like, I think I might not feel hmm. this. And it's not about her songs. It was about being knocked off my chair. Like, you know, it was like when I heard Closer, when I heard the demo of Closer, and I heard the like, dun, 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 dun. And she just had this like, you know, she had like a four on the floor kind of like dancey, empty, hollow sounding, you know, like kick drum. But I already, I knew like the second I heard it, I heard 30 seconds of that. And I knew that A, it was a totally different direction for Tegan, that she had heard me, that she was going to try something different. And that we were, we I believed even then that we had a pop song that was going to do something. 30 seconds. And you always hear these stories about whatever, like Tom Petty, the first time he heard this song and he knew, like, you really do have that moment. I knew it was something totally different. And I don't know, maybe that's what keeps bands. You're welcome. Yeah, you're, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's where we're headed. I did, I did have quite a few of the first singles, although they did not do as well as Closer has done. I mean, I did carry us for like a decade with Walking with a Ghost and Back in Your Head. Well, and Sarah's right. Like, we did have that conversation. Do you guys have a small ledger? We, <laughs> we do. Keep, like... keep everything. Keep track of everything. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah owes me a ton of money right now because of the success, <laughs> but... No, there was definitely that conversation is like, you know, when you've been in a band for 15 years um, and you've been sisters on top of that. So like for only 15 years, for, yeah, <laughs> for 30, I mean, 22 years, 20, 25, 25, 25 years. years, please get the story straight. Sorry. You I can know, fix we, this all in post. Though. I know. Yeah. We'll fix it on Wikipedia. Um, yeah, you want to feel inspired. You want to feel excited. So I was also going back to I was just sitting here thinking about what you just said about people being afraid to be <clears> ambitious. I think we're really lucky, too, because. For us, it doesn't, I don't feel like there's much backlash for us wanting to be ambitious because we do have, you know, we do have sort of minority status in a sense because we're gay and women in a business that's kind of dominated by not gay women. So I think people give us a little room, you know, because I think that there isn't that much out there like us. And so I think that sometimes we get a little bit of a pass. Like I think that our ambition looks like, like, all we had to really say was, instead of saying we were ambitious, we just said we really want to diversify the mainstream. We really want something mm. that reflects us on pop radio. It That's harder to say when you're, like, you know, the quintessential... And this is not a diss. I love Pitchfork, and I actually love a lot of the bands that Pitchfork loves, too. But it is it's it is one of those things where, like, it sounds pretty different if, like, you know, white, straight, privileged guy comes out and says, you know what I really want to do? I want to do more. I want more of the pie that I've already been given. You know, <laughs> That's a strong point. It's yeah. sta- it because sounds let me different. Tell you, this pie is delicious. It yeah. sounds different, and yeah. it's. I think for, yeah. for, so we for us, we got away with some of that. It was okay. I think we yeah. we were the underdog. 
you know, and there wasn't anything that looked like us out there in the mainstream. And so when we said, you know what, we want to be reflected in the mainstream, it doesn't have to be us, but then find something else that looks like us and put it in there because they they should have something like us out there for people like us. All of a sudden it was like, good for you guys. Let's push them ahead 10 spots. And it <laughs> huh. was, and it felt good, yeah. you know, because when I was a teenager, there was like a few things that I like looked up to. There was a few, you know, things that made me feel comfortable, but there wasn't a lot of it. And I think that that drives us, that drives us still. Like, you know, I talk all the time about this, but that I'm at a point in my career where it's it's not my ambition is not money or fame or popularity. My ambition has changed. Like now, like I look out into our audience and it's my favorite part of what we do. And I look at those faces. A lot of them are very young and they look so grateful and relieved. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, you know, like, I mean, we, we've done a lot of really great touring in the last couple of years, but, you know, going all over Asia and going all over Central, you know, Europe, a lot of places we've never been before where a lot of young people feel really oppressed by their government, yeah. feel really oppressed by, you know, mainstream culture. And like, we're really alternative still there. And we get up on stage and they think, they don't go, ew, you were on stage with Taylor Swift. They come up to us and say, wow, like that's what's happening in North America is that you're being accepted by the most popular person mm -hmm. coming out of that country. That's massive. That like changes everything. I really don't care about being popular but i love the idea that we brought hope to some people that's like and it sounds that's like i'm sure like people right now are like oh god like <laughs> blah 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 like when you hear people talk about like our fans are the best i'm not saying that i know that there are they're millions they're, they're actually some of the worst <laughs> people ever i'm not saying that i think our fans of course are the best to us but but i mean like that's big that's totally different and all i needed was a handful of that to happen for me to be like this is not about being cool or popular or getting the cover of spin this is about the fact that like 12 years ago, we were not being accepted the way we are now. And, and not just because we're gay, actually, I think more just because we were women. Yeah. You know, when Walking with a Ghost was on alternative radio, we, you know, when we cracked the top 10 out of like 40 people or whatever it was on the chart, like I remember sitting there with our publicists at the time and looking down the list, there was one other woman on the list. Mm. And I just remember thinking like, this is big, you know, we're pushing, we're pushing boundaries. We're saying... We write our own songs and we perform them ourselves and we, you know, are producing our own stuff and we're running our business and we're in charge and no one's telling us what to do. And that in conjunction with us being gay and now trying to cross genres and doing all this other stuff, like it's really made us something way bigger than our own music. Like it's bigger than that. Our music maybe isn't as important now. It's just the whole hmm. culture and community around us, you know? Well, what's it like then to, to do this? Because, you know, we, I saw you guys a year ago. You were about to set off on this, and people were saying this was a risk. It is now mostly reward, it appears to me. Um, what was this like? What was it like going into the machine? I mean, you I cannot comprehend how many shows you seem to have played, how many trips you have <laughs> taken. How, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's incomprehensible, and, it's, and you're about to do it again. <laughs> I mean, without sounding like I'm complaining, I will say this. That this is a safe space. This is a safe space, yeah. <laughs> Just the three of us, I've, nobody else. Nobody else will ever hear this. Did I imply otherwise? <laughs> um, I, I always use the analogy of class, you know, that, that when, you're, when we were growing up, you know, our mom was raising us as a single parent. Obviously, my dad was still in the picture. I don't mean to completely cast him as a villain, but my mom was, for the most <clears> part, <throat> six and a half days of the week, was taking care of us mm -hmm. and going back to school with student loans and, you know, really trying to raise us up out of, you know, a sort of lower middle class existence. And um, I grew up thinking that if you had more, you worried less. And, uh, you know, then we got, we then we were, you know, suddenly we were in the middle class and I thought to myself, oh my God, you know, my friends whose parents were like doctors and lawyers, like I'd never even thought about th that level There's before. There's something beyond. And I thought to myself, oh, <laughs> this is what our mother worked so hard for and I'm, we're going to go out and we're going to do something that's going to lift us even higher than, you know, than, than we were before and, and that we will worry less. And then... Now, you know, like I'm thinking about the le different levels of our career, you know, when I when we put out So Jealous, that was the first time that I thought to myself, this is a real career, like I could really make something of myself. And I think I made, you know, enough money that year to put down like a down payment, like get a mortgage on, a, on, an, on an apartment in Montreal. I was like 26 years old. And I thought, like, now I, I'm really an adult and I'm in a like I'm, I'm middle class and I'm in a, you know, whatever. And now, you know, straight up, like we're upper middle class. We make more money than probably our parents ever made. And, you know, and I worry more than I have ever worried in my entire life. Yeah. I when I was making $13,000 and driving around in the back of a minivan with Tegan and stressing out about my life, I worried a lot. I, I was afraid that I wasn't going to amount to anything, that I was going to disappoint my family, that we were never going to be popular, whatever it was. 
I worry as much or more about all the same things that I used to and more. <laughs> I worry about death. I worry about <laughs> being washed up. I worry about comment boards. I worry about looking like a jerk. I I, I worry that we're going to make lousy records after this. I, I still worry as much as I've ever worried. And so that seems like a really depressing answer to, you know, you know, like to your question. But the truth is, is that as I'm so proud of what we did because I know that it, I know that even though it didn't feel like a risk to us, it was mm-hmm. perceived as a risk and I'm proud of the accomplishments, but I'm just as worried <laughs> about our future as I've ever been before. And I think it's Which just... Which is why it's great to stay busy. Yeah. Because you don't have a lot of time to process it's those true. things, you know, right. like the last year and a half we did accomplish so much and we did so much cool stuff and we toured so much and we were so busy and the balance between personal and business was completely out of whack. Yeah. And it's I, so and, scary to stop. And then, yeah, you stop and it's like, whoa, like, so there's almost this like real addiction and desire to just keep going. And do more. Put you, your head yeah. back down and just keep working because when you put your head up, you realize like how high you are. Like you realize... It's the it's the old roadrunner thing. If you keep running off <laughs> For the cliff. Yeah, just keep going. I had the, some of the most embarrassingly... <clears throat> obvious dreams around, you know, about the halfway point on this record. I remember really specifically... Making it or, or working it? No, like when we were about halfway through <laughs> the last year of working this record, you know, things were going really, really well and we were doing all this crazy stuff and things were just so great. Like, really, like the momentum was so great. And I was having all these super embarrassingly obvious dreams. Like, I had this one dream that I was in an elevator with Nate from Fun, the lead singer mm-hmm. of Fun. And we're in this elevator and it's just crazy like we're just shooting to the top you know and i (laughs) we get out of the elevator and we're sitting at a bar at the top of some building and i'm saying to him like don't why god don't you feel scared to ride that elevator all the time like it just seems so wild and unreliable and whatever and i just woke up and was like god i'm embarrassing like you know like i think that there is there's something about like tegan said like when you when you really look around and see how high you've gotten you are very aware of how quickly you cannot be that high. Or just um, say you, you realize know. the you recognize <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, oh, totally yeah. do it. <laughs> you could have died. I almost died. You could have died. But it was worth it. That's horrible. That's a really good answer. Yeah. I know I hate mm-hmm, talking really. about my dreams, but I think that that is an example of how deeply this is this last year and a half has affected well, our pr- subconscious. Yeah. I mean, well, it's there's just pressure. Weird. Like I think what Sarah's saying is like you the further we get in our career or we work harder and harder and harder and harder and there is this this, this sort of like pressure that starts to really build up inside of you and some of it is just really silly pressure it's that well what if we did retire you'd be letting down so many people Mm. you know like what if what if all the pressure like it made Sarah and I like hate each other and like that relationship was gone forever you know or what if we did put out a record that like kind of ruined the legacy and I'm using air quotes like of Tegan and Sarah like there's this pressure when more people are paying attention to you. Like when we were kind of obscure and fun and singing songs in the back of the van and we had like a funny, you know, hodgepodge group of like ragamuffin musicians and crew people and we were just having a good time and no one was paying any attention. We really were just purely doing it for the fun of it, you know? Like, I mean, we were, of course, have we had ambitions to like climb as artists, but as you start to voice your goals and ambitions, you, there just starts to be this really intense pressure and I think we're just not quite used to it yet but (laughs) but it is great to put your head back down and just get back to work and realize that like at its core like we are still ultimately just trying to write good music we're really just trying to find a way like through music to create you know stories about our lives and our experiences that are hopefully you know edible by our audience you know (coughs) just die again sorry no god give us a sign throw up your hand next time you got a cough (laughs) okay i'm just gonna ask a question then try to hold it in again yeah You can sort of hear people listening and hear my voice just go. Yeah, they're like, he's crying. He's so touched. <laughs> crying he's so touched by their career. That was such a beautiful story about the middle class. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't Our social something. worker mom, she just wanted us to get <laughs> from lower middle class to middle class, and we did it. <laughs> you did it, you guys. Yeah. Call it I, was, I feel like people like really, I got some I got some suspicious looks when I call our industry blue collar, but it is. You know, well, like for I think most, for most, for most people, people, like, you know, like for most of us, we are not selling 40 million singles like you know sainthood i don't even think i think sainthood sold like 150,000 copies i mean we are blue collar we get out there and we work for it you know (laughs) like and i that's what i why i respect our job so much because we get in a vehicle every night and drive for eight hours and we get there and we load in and we play the show and we do the meet and greets and we shake hands and i look out into the audience and i'm truly doing it because i freaking love it like we also like we're all constantly 
It happens so much. You know, these 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 pieces in the New York Times or wherever, like demystifying, you know, the industry and musicians explaining like how hard it is and how much money we spend and Here's how little we make. Here's a copy of my mortgage that yeah. I can prove right. that I have and nothing. Tr- and I always ask myself, you know, why, why? Why do we feel like we have to do that? And it's like, well, because we're, we have the best jobs in the world. It's annoying to hear people complain. It is. It's yeah. annoying to hear people complain, but it's also annoying <clears> to have people think that you're... I mean, I live in a one-bedroom apartment. I, I, I mean, like <laughs> it's twenty-five thousand square feet. It's, so, it's so. not. It's, it's, it's got it's a big entire. Floor it's got a huge living room. My yeah. You know, it's a rental. I my bathroom looks like a Greek restaurant. I don't like. <sighs> It's not you. You do. There is a compulsion. But what other industry do you have to justify to what money you make? Well, like that's is, the thing. My mom, thing. as a social worker, it's not like she's sitting around with her other social worker friends, being like, "Look, you know what? I put my twenty years in. You guys, I get to make whatever she makes." You know, like I don't. Right. I think our mom's like driving through the streets in her new little uh, co- mini, mini Cooper, Cooper with like a grill on. She's like, "Eat." You know, like, just, she could care less. Just she hitting care. switches, hydraulics in the car. She's like, what, what? I'm a social worker. She doesn't, she's not proving anything to anybody. She's fine. <laughs> no, it's only these weird leftover artist oh punk. Oh, my God. I know. Uh, hey, when I saw that Bob Dylan worst. commercial during the Super Bowl. Yeah, right? I actually said out loud, I was like, yeah, that's right. You know, like, at some point, and again, it's cheesy and lots of people will be like, yeah, yeah. But, like, I never, we never consumed ourselves with, like, selling out or any of those stupid things. Like, I'm, we're, we're selling our music. You're selling, period. Yeah. That is part of That's what, what we doing. do. We sell music. And if a commercial wants to buy the right to do that and it gives us an audience that we wouldn't have had otherwise, I mean, it's <clears> still about the music. Now, if you're making crappy music and you're doing it with the intention of trying to get a commercial, fine. But we never write anything with that intention. We always write the intention. I, my sole purpose of writing music, my sole intention initially is just to make Sarah say yes this is something original, new, and I like it. That is solely why I do it. You know, beyond just trying to expel right. this emotion that I have inside of me. But, like, I just want Sarah to like it. If Sarah likes it, she is my biggest critic. And if she likes it, then it's real. Then she felt it, it's genuine, and we can put it on CD. And then the secondary concern is the fact that it's called Febreze Smells So Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's just yeah. That's just happenstance. I think so we're what? classy. When we sell out, we're classy. Yeah. We sold out for Oreo. Yeah. You know? We sold out for Lego. These are classic... <clears throat> You know, childhood, childhood right. things. Like, I mean, I don't think we're picking anything terrible. So I have to ask you guys, among the perks of global dominance, or at least global... Uh, awareness. Global awareness. Global light general, awareness. Yeah. General awareness. Uh, you guys were on stage with Taylor Swift. I alluded to it earlier. What's that like? Just just talk me through that. What is that like? Because that is an... Ex- I feel like, you know, maybe... I'm 25 years old. Maybe I could sell out a show in Poland one day. But I will never be on stage in California with Taylor Swift. That's not going to happen. Probably not. Listen, before we got a phone call from Taylor's manager to ask us to be on stage, <clears throat> we certainly never imagined that we would be on stage. With you Taylor just happened Swift. to be both in the same city at the same time? No, we got we knew that we were going to do it well in advance. I mean, we got the call from our managers that, you know, that Taylor was doing this thing every single night. She was bringing up an artist, usually from, right. you know, the, some proximity to the, the the city that she was in or some relevance and um, was bringing them up to do a song of theirs, you know, not a song of hers. And this, of course, I mean, the old reflex kicked in where I want to say no, because I hate doing things that make me feel scared or nervous. No one will know who we are. No one will know who we are. We yeah. don't sound good. We don't We're so short to. compared to Taylor. Yeah. I mean, That's I a serious thing. She's very tall. I obsessed oh my God. over her height. People gave us so much advice it. about it. They were just like, you need to stand in front of her at all times. If she tries to get in front of you, you get in front of her, because the more you stand in front of her, the, t- the more you'll like look her height. Oh, for the people in the pack, they'll think you're the yeah. same size. Yeah. It's brilliant. This is a big, <laughs> it was a big deal. That was probably my biggest my biggest worry. But um, yeah, no, I think that we just realized... Like, I mean, at this point, it's just like we're just we're just taking a lot of we're taking a lot of chances. And we knew that it was a chance to go up in front of an audience that this was going to be like a big night for them. Like Taylor Swift, you know, this was probably like akin to like when we went to the New Kids on the Block concert when we were like eight. Like we this would be the concert we would probably see. Maybe the first concert. Maybe the first concert we would ever see. And we would probably be, you know, um, filing away every detail, crazy details. I remember the inside of the car of the woman Mm -hmm. who took us to the concert to see New Kids on the Block at eight years old. I remember what the car, the inside of that car looked like. I remember, I remember that I had one of those green glow in the dark things. Like I remember the color of that. I remember the thoughts in my head when they came out on stage I remember thinking they can't be real they're really real like they're human like having this like you know I don't know existential like profound moment where I was like wow they're human you know this whole thing and I just kept thinking like that's why I want to do it because a lot of the kids that are going to be in that room are going to have that night maybe not remembering us but maybe and that, listen, when I play a show, Tegan, you know, talked about going to Central and Eastern Europe and Asia and whatever, like a lot of those people that come to those shows are having a very profound experience and are excited, <clears throat> mm-hmm. but they're not, 
having the experience of like a nine year old going to the first concert and Taylor Swift like this like yeah. larger than life character, and then we and then and then these like weird. Like kind of like androgynous, you young, know, young, really young, yeah, very, super very young, young super young, creepy, 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 creepy young. young Taylor brings out her young cousins to yeah. 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 about. I just, I just kept thinking like this is gonna make make a mark. And you know, it was such a fun night. I was so impressed with Taylor. She is really eloquent, very smart. She is a boss. Like she is. Yeah. She, as soon as we got there, she knew exactly what she wanted us to do. We ran through it. She <clears throat> she convinced us. No one on earth could convince us to do this but Taylor. She convinced us to come up on one of those hydraulic lifts in the center of the stage. Run down the sides. We ran up and down during we, the choruses. We had and we cordless microphones. I mean. Like, do you not even realize you were doing it as it happened? Yeah, just, you just do what blurs, Taylor tells you to do. Just do what she says. Yeah, you do what Taylor tells you just to do. Just follow Taylor and make, yeah. but don't follow her literally. literally don't get follow in front her. of her. Get in front of her. <laughs> get in front of her. You have to double time because you're short. Yeah. You're like half we go to her hip, you know? So it was <laughs> an amazing And then there's just night. a gaggle. Remember that how we feel on stage is mainly just all of that. But then also there's this gaggle of, like, our record company people, a few friends, right. a couple family members and our managers. And most of them are looking at us the way that I'm sure a lot of people, maybe you included, are like, holy crap, T and Sarah on tour, or, I mean, on stage with Taylor Swift, what is happening? Yeah. And it's cool. It's really cool. You get off stage. I mean, we're, we're friends with Sarah Barlis, and she did it the night before us. Right. And, you know, I think we all had a very similar experience like that Sarah just described. It's this very strange, amazing sensation where the energy of 18,000 really excited, like, young, um, you know, super fans of Taylor Swift are looking at you and going, oh, well, if Taylor likes you, then I like you. It's just this, like, intense energy being projected at you. And we experience a lot of intense energy, surely, on stage, but it's not anything like we've experienced. I mean, and the fact that we got on and off that stage without tripping or falling... You know, I was really consumed because Taylor really wanted us to jump up and down in one of the choruses. So I kind of I watched. She footage. micromanages to that degree. She did. Yeah. She, she demanded jumping. She said as soon oh, as yeah. I, she said the first time she I heard this song, everything. I thought about getting eighteen thousand people to jump up and down in the chorus, which we'd never thought of that. We'd already played the song four hundred <laughs> times, so but not even in our minds we had thought. No, of it. It's never even occurred to you. But she never was really like even in rehearsal, really wanted us to jump up and down. And I've watched the footage, and if you go and watch it, like I don't really I jump up and down once, and then I kind of just do this like weird fake hop because I was consumed with singing. Right. Because how do you do both? How do you do both? That takes training. Here's how you do both. Tegan, Sarah, Taylor, six background singers, and I'm sure there's some drag in there too. Yeah. It sounds awesome. No and it doesn't what. matter if you jump up and down. If you sound out of breath, they'll just edge up the, the, the professional <laughs> singers behind you. It was right. like amazing. And so Taylor looks like she's having a really great time. I look like I'm struggling to jump up and down. I look a little like, you know, like I'm scared and, and I've never jumped up and down on stage before. So it was amazing. All the, that's, that's what happens. That was three minutes of our lives, you know? It's like yeah. all that thought. But what a three minutes. It was amazing. <clears throat> it was amazing. Will you integrate some of that into your performance going forward? Like, you guys are going on tour with, with Katy Perry, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think we need to be aware of not completely changing what is both relatable and cutely awkward about us. I think, you know, like, part of what makes us us is that we don't post pictures of ourselves smoking joints in our bras, but also that we don't... You take them. We take them. You don't post them. For people privately, but we don't necessarily <laughs> send them out to the world too much. We don't want to break the internet. And so I think, in a way, our show, we want it to always be developing and changing, but what Taylor does, Taylor does. And, you know, what we do... Um, you probably won't see us running up a runway of our own anytime no. soon. But Tegan wants to potentially use cordless mics because she thinks that we could move around on the stage. And, and I don't is... mean like dancing and singing and jumping up and down. I even mean I'm picturing what Pink did at the Grammys. Exactly. I'm just thinking of course, more yeah. air stuff, you know, like just hanging air off stuff. air stuff. I don't know what that's called. That's like acrobatic. Aerial, 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 aerial air stuff. acrobatics yeah. need wireless mics. No, you know, I, even just <laughs> I know it sounds really silly, but like I'm starting to think of our show in a way I hadn't before, and I think like we do really long funny. This is sort of what we're known for, long, funny introductions and stories. Yes, you do. And we introduce the band, and there's this very awkward, weird thing, and you won't be able to see it, of course, because this is radio, but you guys will hear it, but like, where you're trying to introduce the band, but you're looking back and forth, and you're talking, you're off the mic, and you're on the mic, and it's confusing because you're trying to look at the people you're introducing, and right. even just for that one simple part of the show, to be able to have a wireless mic and say, and this is Jasper, our bass player, and like, you know, he's right here. I just started thinking... This was our first record where Sarah and I sing songs where we don't play instruments. We're right. both accomplished piano players and <clears throat> guitar players, and we play and sing and, and do all that on stage, and we've always felt like we had to do that. And this was the first record where 
wow, I can not sing on Drove Me Wild. I can just, or sorry, not play guitar on Drove Me Wild. I can just sing. And so this is the next evolutional step. It's like, well, maybe we don't need all these chords and we don't need to be trapped behind an instrument. We don't need to be trapped behind a mic all the time. Like we can move around a little bit. And these are natural evolutional steps, I these think. Are, these are... But it took 15 years for us to even be talked into a wireless I mean, thank mic. God we weren't in charge of electricity <laughs> or, like, discovering the wheel or whatever. Like, we just... It takes us a long time long to get anywhere. Time. We have to think about it a long time. We're Virgos. We're very pragmatic. We, also you know, Canadian, too. I mean, like, Canadian, more thoughtful... Yeah. I th- my biggest but our stage looks messy to me. Like literally, it's just an aesthetic oh, thing. I see. Yeah, Tegan gross. wants to change it because she hates the way it looks. It's I'm just like... like all these cords everywhere. Even our guitars. Like when we found <laughs> out how much it costs to go to wireless, like you know, so you don't have that big long right. cord hanging off you. Like, and I'm sure people out there are laughing because probably no one would ever notice these things. But I do. Like as a Virgo, I walk into our stage and I'm tripping over cords. And my, I'm, I watched a video of me recently playing, and I'm like constantly grabbing the cord and moving it. It's like wrapped around my foot. Like I just think we look, we look kind of antiquated now because we have. Well, this, one, you're very old. We're we're old mature. and uh, we're mature. You know, at 25, like we need to get with it. Like you know, like watching Lord at the Grammys. I'm like, she's our age and she knows this. Like, why are we? And she's got cool metal space gloves. <laughs> she's awesome. You guys need that. We need to. No, anyway. So yes, we're we're in a probably. I think, you know, this or in 2013 we were on stage with Katy Perry and Taylor Swift mm-hmm. and Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. Like, right. we got to step up our game if we want to be at that level. You can only be the cute outsiders for so long, you know. <laughs> at some point, you, gotta... you need to embrace wireless technology. Do you know, though, I think we're, we're like, fundamentally, I, don't, I think both of us are so deeply embarrassed by anything hubris and, like, the, the idea that anyone would think we were at true. We, we joke about being heartthrobs. We joke about right. people liking us. But we're the idea that we would actually have to be those people sometimes is actually really embarrassing to us. I feel like you're gonna have to get used to it. Yeah, you know? I, know. I mean, slowly but surely. Yeah. By the time we're 30, we're gonna have this down. You path. guys just keep keep trying the prize. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a process. <laughs> we're 19. Stop putting so much pressure on us. I know. God, you guys are kids. You're just starting out. Those babies. I can't I believe all you've accomplished in the one year since you had that meeting with your young's manager. It's pretty crazy. Easy. Um, we should wrap up, although I feel bad because the one thing that you'd said to me when we discussed doing a podcast a year ago was as long as we don't talk about music. Oh my god. Well, you want to talk about TV. Can we just talk about it a little bit? Take I mean, me a little bit? I, I got it. I'm other than my coughing fits, which are out of control. Um, I we'll look at we'll look at the publicist. He says thumbs up. He's ready to go. Yeah, he's fine. Ooh, he's he went fine. like this five ish. We got five ish minutes to talk you about know, TV. Okay, I so. will, I'll say this. I I love what's happened with TV and the whole culture of writing about TV because. I mean, not to pick on music writing, and I think there are still like hey, you're preaching the choir. There here. is, there's not, there are really important, there are really important people writing about important aspects of music and the way that it intersects with identity politics and race yeah. politics and just you know the, the, that what's happening right now in 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 music writing is is cool to me. In certain, there are certain parts of music writing that are really interesting to me and are culturally important and significant in terms of like how it interfaces with my brain which may not necessarily sell magazines, and I appreciate that. But I've been so fascinated by the culture of of TV writing. And I think for me, like, we grew up in the 80s and 90s and watched a hell of a lot of TV, like a lot. And then I didn't have cable for almost 10 years and didn't have the internet. And so TV is, like, a new obsession again in the last, like, five-ish years. So it's been, I mean, and it's a lifesaver on tour, goes without saying. And um, I think that, obviously, TV, and you've said this many times, TV has been amazing, like, in the last 10-ish years. Like, it's yeah. just, it's it's a, it's a remarkable thing. So I think it, I think what Grantland does and, like, what obviously you're doing and, and, and a lot of other people are doing to write about it is, like, it's a whole form of writing and, and like, cultural writing that I think is, is in its early days and is really cool. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty cool, too. You, you are, are really. Great question. You no, are really cool. But I will say, I mean, it's, I, I really appreciate what Tegan, what you were saying about the reach of what you're doing beyond the songs, because to be honest, what <clears throat> what I appreciate writing about music, uh, sorry, writing about TV now, is it actually feels like I'm writing about culture that people are invested in and engaged in on a daily level. Right. Mm-hmm. Writing about music can be that, as you said, mm-hmm. and it can touch on issues that are in a way that actually are, are much more immediate than TV or movies can right. at its at their best. At its best, music can do it. But the day to day worrying about it, it became a lot more about to me about like. Um, you know, it's like a little bit of a little, like a, a skirmish. Sure. You know, this is yeah. my side, that's your side. Yeah. And we're just going to fight it out over these small things. Whereas writing about TV, like there's a big audience, people are watching it, people are excited about it. Yeah. There's nothing more negative in my experience than the 
Uh, there's nothing more negative in the world than a comments thread, obviously, below oh an article on the internet. God. But there's particularly nothing more negative than a comments thread below an article about music. It's I agree. Almost it's worse than politics. Enough. Whereas TV, people it's are generally enough. coming at it from a place where like, well, I like the show too, yeah. or I like the medium. Mm-hmm. You know, I just might disagree with you, but the music is becomes so vicious and personal it's yeah. that it's hard to engage in. But I wonder, Agreed. I wonder, this is something I was thinking about the other day because I was actually um, pontificating about television like, and how it... It's kind of the thing I'm most jealous of because it gets to come back every week and it can keep up with what's happening currently. It right, can it's evolve. Yeah. And I mean, I know some TV isn't because some is filmed and then gets released. And so it's a little bit behind, but especially like it started because people were bashing the sitcom. Mm-hmm. And I was saying, but one cool thing I know lots of sitcom writers is that it is current in some way, you yeah. know, like even something as simple as like, um, oh crap, I'm just going to blank on it. But oh, South Park, you know, like how it's been oh, so political so and subversive. Immediate, and, yeah. yeah. And so immediate. And I was saying that television is like kind of the one genre I'm really jealous of. Like right now, movies seem like so old and slow yeah. and boring. And like we're so used to the. We're so used to that peak at 32 minutes of like, you know, like, okay, now this big thing happened and then we write out the rest of the episode. And so now you go to a movie and at like an hour and eight minutes, you're like, I've been here forever. (laughs) And it's just like, I can't watch a movie at home. I have to go to the movie theater or else I will stop watching it if I'm watching (laughs) at home where, because, and I can watch eight hours of television because there's just this constant high happening every 30 minutes. And so... I was saying that I really am jealous of TV because as an artist and as a musician and a writer and as a person who feels very tapped into what's happening and my emotions and my stories, it's hard to be on a two and a half year cycle. Like, and you I feel might like have new things to say. I have you so wanna, many things yeah. to say and I've grown There's exponentially. There's so many anxieties we just heard about yeah. from your sister. That, and I was in, you know, Downer. six months of, of rehearsals and pre-production and then I just toured for a year. I've, I've gone, I've grown exponentially as a writer, as a performer, as a singer, as a person. And I have to wait to tell you about it. And yeah. that's hard. And as I so TV is this like really weird place for me right now where it's like I watch it as almost like it's my genre. It's my it's it's my world. And I don't know anything about TV. I'm not involved in TV in any way. And yet I think of it like my peer and I'm like, look at what they're doing in TV. And it really influences me as a person because it is it is up to up to speed. And I was gonna say about the comment sections is that music does feel really personal. Whereas like TV feels like commentary, and yeah. so like I feel like people I mean, and that can be a good thing because music is really great. about self identity, totally. and defining yourself. But then people get on there and they start being vulnerable and talking about themselves and their experience to the music, and it just opens you up for criticism. It yeah. feels so personal, and 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 that's why I've always I don't read I've never read reviews. I don't read any music journalism. I don't read music magazines, and the reason why is because you can't tell me what I'm going to experience when I listen to music. Right, it's impossible. It's mine. That's what makes it so special. As an artist, that's what makes me want to do what I do. Is looking at two thousand different people experience right well based on my experience or something i filter my experience and then you filter my experience and like and then it, you share the experience at a concert with each other and but... the community and your whatever and that is why i can't get into music journalism and why i can't get into music because it's just it's it, to me it is just a group experience and it's a personal experience and i don't know so but tv feels different you know it does feel really different and do i you, like that do you feel afraid to write things and put it up and have people criticize you <laughs> um do you care Oh, of course I care. That everyone's lying. I feel like everyone, everyone who cares. writes is a liar. Everyone who First says First of all, everyone writes is a liar, but everyone every, who does oh, say wow. they don't read the comments, Bold. everyone everyone I know I'm out there today. <laughs> every, I mean everyone reads the comments. Yeah. Everyone reads the comments. And I, my new thing is that I write responses and then don't hit send. Oh, like I'll, I'll I'll tweet at someone or I just don't do it. Yeah. Cuz I don't engage cuz you don't want to do can't that. You can engage. But yeah. It doesn't help anyone. No. But but yeah, it it is yeah, it but it's actually somehow for the most part easier for me with TV because like we we're saying it's it seems like a communal experience. Where and also it, it's a the ride keeps going. So if I had a comment that you disagreed with about episode 8 of Orange is the New Black, we got four more hours. Yeah. You know, and then we have another season and it's it's a it, there are peaks and valleys on this ride and it it's not, and it's understood that there might be some clunkers in there. Yeah. It can't be perfect. Whereas an album that people obsess over for a year when it's received as the shining, well, I don't know if people receive it as a shining disc anymore, but as a as a as an item, as a thing, I think people expect it to be the summation of everything that you put into it. Sure, I have one, I have so many questions, but I have one more question because I know we have to wrap it up. But one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, as this is such an, I mean, this is really such an early stage in TV writing, like people really doing this and people tuning in to right. to read it all the time. Um, do you feel like? There's always this this criticism of music journalism that even if people 
didn't think whatever Vampire Weekend's new record was the number one record of the year. It's very difficult to deviate from, you right. know, what what is sort of generally understood um, as like even even like a maybe Vampire Weekend's a bad one, but like say Kanye West. Everybody, a lot of critics obviously wanted to properly acknowledge how significant that record was, while also saying but we did, didn't necessarily enjoy listening to it. And, you know, but it still makes the year end top list, whereas the records we probably listen to all the time and are super comfortable with, uh, they the, don't necessarily... The difference between, like, the, the, the populist versus... Yeah, the... like, do you do you think that's going to happen with TV? Like, where people are going to... It's going to that it's gonna fall into that form of everybody sort of needing to fall on the same line as, like, liking a show or not liking a show or... I, I think it already has to some degree. I mean, the internet helps speed that up. I mean, there definitely is... A sense of unanimity about a lot of things that mm -hmm. everyone is ready to you know no one broke no one broke the line on Breaking Bad everyone yeah. thought it was the best show ever and the best whatever you know and when I had some issues with the finale I got jumped on for it because how dare you everyone right. agrees this is this perfect thing it helps that it really was great mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know I think that it's it helps any art to have dissent and for people to be pointing out different things yeah, about mm -hmm. it um, I think I, I do would worry that it, I, I do worry if it's as a new I don't, I'm not going to call it an art form, but as a new form of discourse or whatever that it becomes codified into just one unified way of looking at things, with, right. especially with one type of person writing that thing, one yeah. voice. I think the more voices, the better to cover it. That's um, what I've found so interesting already is that it's like the way that like like the the voice will cover something or you know the one thing I really like about Grantland I have to say is is that you know I think that you cover a lot of the you know whatever how like the higher brow. You know, Air te quotes. television. I know I wanted to use them and I scratched my head instead. But I, but then the, you guys also like do running commentary on, like the site itself does running commentary on like the Housewives, yes. um, you know, brand, which I find hilarious and I don't even really watch that show. I just find it like a funny new thing to read. I don't even need to know about it. The way I would like read about like, I don't know, like a really interesting article on golf in the New Yorker. I don't golf. I don't know anything about golf, but I like reading about it when it's done in a certain voice. So. I guess in a weird way, TV is like that, different than music. Well, I think, I hopefully it's the same in the sense that um, I don't really like snobbery in anything. Mm. And, you know, in music, like like you were saying before, I love Taylor Swift record. I love the last Death Cab record. I don't really distinguish between them. You know, yeah. I like pop music a lot yeah. and I like challenging, I like the Kanye record. And I think that a lot of p TV, maybe in the way people think about it, is is relatively new in the way people treating it like an important thing. And one of the first ways people treat some make something important is they stake out the boundaries. Well, this is TV, but right. that garbage isn't. You right. know, the, the sitcoms on CBS don't matter; they're not worthy of discussion. Which is, the, which, the, that's kind of similar to music, though, because like yeah. that's something that I always used to say to Sarah. Like, I never have gone. Like, I don't go to Pitchfork or Sarah Gummer or any of those things. That was always Sarah's territory. And, and you divided the internet between. Kind of. Well, I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't care because I didn't want to read about music, yeah. so it didn't matter to me. But it really influenced Sarah because she became consumed with, well, we need to be embraced by those people, and journalists do need to love us, and you know, I want to be accepted in the indie rock community, and I want to be seen as being relevant and cool. And meanwhile, over in my world, you know, she would joke that I was still listening to like, you know, '90s music or pop punk or whatever. But I was also tapped into like AP and like these bands that yeah. I'd never heard of that were putting out records and selling 400,000 copies of it while we were being, you know rejoiced and, and, you know, praised over in this world and selling 80,000 records. And I just was like, well, I need to understand what's going on everywhere. And to me, the parallel in TV is, is that you can say Breaking Bad's amazing or that everything that comes out on Showtime or HBO is like the bee's knees. But like 16 million people aren't watching it. They're watching NCIS. That's so right. so it's like for me, it's like as much as I like to watch all the highbrow, amazing like TV out there, like I also do think there's something really relevant about what's happening in sitcoms and NCIS because they're writing constantly. So they're constantly talking about pop culture in a way that's really relevant. It, you know, and people are watching them. And, and people are watching them. And, and people... you can't just rec you can't just say, oh well, 16 million people like this, or, or you know, 20 million people bought a Nickelback record, and all those people are stupid or they're idiots. They're not. Like main... maybe 10 million. <laughs> Fine, some of them might be total jerks. But I mean... but to me, like, and that's what helps Sarah and I feel comfortable in the pop realm is is that like, sure, some people that listen to Taylor Swift maybe aren't the type of people who listen to Tegan and Sarah, but there's a really good chance a lot of them are. Yeah. Just like people who watch Breaking Bad might might surf over to NCIS at the end of the show. Not to, to, to strive for, like, a unified concept here <laughs> as a way to, to end on a Let's nice try. note. But, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll make a little reach for it. it. It's interesting to hear you say that because it suggests that in terms of what, what I'm trying to do in, in critiquing and in actually people who are creating art, there's, some, there's something that's similar here because it's much... I think it's always better from both sides of the ball instead of dismissing something out of hand to say, well, Why? Why? Yeah. Why is this popular? What do people like about yeah. it? And what can I learn from that? Yeah. And, and and even in writing, like, 
it's better to it you know I, I just wrote a pan of a of a cbs show this morning before i got here it was terrible but i tried to engage it on its own merits i wasn't saying it's terrible because it's not breaking bad it was terrible because it was terrible Got which it. is yeah. why which is why i tune in to read what you write and what you know like for example like you know i have I read I read the New Yorker. I read it every week. I've done it for almost ten years. And you know when when Sasha Fair Jones writes something about something obscure, I love it. And when he tackles Taylor Swift, I'm even more delighted. You know, like the reality is is that when you appreciate somebody's voice and somebody's, um, you know, regular discourse, it's fun to read it about the cool show, and it's fun to read it about you know the really bad show that you can't believe somebody you know twenty million people watch, whatever it is. The Bachelor. I'm probably one of them. Tegan probably one of those, is watching. Yeah, one of those people. I'm yeah. taking my cultural cues from what's popular. This is good. This and is I'm for you guys. Her. Yin yang. It's perfect. We are. Yeah. We balance each other. We're just going to get further and hey, further Hey, we'll say away. it's worked to our advantage, though, because yeah. we were both fans of Paramore, but when we got offered that tour, Sarah was like, I don't think that that's our audience, or it might be weird, or I can't remember the exact. I want, want to say, I don't want to say that she said one thing or the other, but she was not 100% sure, and I had been to a Paramore concert, and I was like, I bet you that audience is going to really dig Tegan and Sarah, and it was the best opening slot yeah. we've ever had, because that audience loves Paramore for all these reasons, you know, A to Z, and in a lot of ways, those actually are common things that people love about our, you know, audience. So there was a lot of common ground there. And well, you've always been better at recognizing the DNA of things that I, you know, immediately, uh, you know, don't 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 see being like us. I'm desperately searching for a way to not sound like an ass. Like I just, <laughs> I think like you've always been much better at that. I think my field of vision has always been much narrower. <laughs> well, you're yeah. too busy reading golf articles. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I mean, Boring. All, yeah, and we all have our own course. <laughs> There's like, let's just get together with five other people at a coffee shop and read the, the New Yorker. And I'm like, let's go play to 5,000 people a night. <laughs> and between the two of you, you play <laughs> We've for managed a, to eke out a living. Yeah, a 1,500 person coffee shop <laughs> yeah. and you find you split the difference. Um, you guys, it is, as always, such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank Thanks you. For I look us. forward to doing this, hopefully again, maybe in a year, when you are at another level of superstardom. <laughs> and, you know, looking down the barrel at 30, and maybe it might be time to reflect Let's on... Let's come back on our 30th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I yeah. look forward to that. Yeah. See you in five years. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to Grantland. To hear more Grantland shows in your earballs, subscribe to Grantland Sports and Grantland Pop Culture on iTunes. Or... Go to grantland.com and click on podcasts.